<laughs> yeah. It's a, Are we it's all over this compact today? Yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe we are. I haven't heard from anyone explicitly saying that they're coming. So uh, I guess that's it. Alex and Dennis are going to listen in too. I had an earlier talk to, to them today about our main topic that, that I, I just thought that we should hear your views on also. Uh, how how will the the UI navigation and views um, evolve in in the in the what have they evolved so maybe we are behind and what will they be uh, when we have this web services usually you know like app style things tablets and computers and they uh, I think that, that our current way of doing things is very much centered around an office yeah. but out of office it might not be the perfect fit i know it's not no uh, but the perfect fit might be hard to come by but uh, we might get uh, closer anyway so i'm going to turn on the presentation on the screen here let's see uh, Yeah. Hi, Alex and Dennis. How are you doing? Good Hello. Day. Sorry for that we are late. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So um, we wrote this uh, several years ago, and it's in the book as well. <clears throat> that uh, and trying to get to the uh, bottom of the design patterns in modern applications. And I think it's have served us good. And I think it's the right way to go about it, to think about the generic um, um, structures rather than just solving each application on its own merits, application per application. And, and I sort of miss this discussion from other frameworks and other strategies because they usually take one example and say we put uh, these buttons over here and we put this UI over here because it looks nice but seriously it must be some kind of uh, deeper reason for sorting things and, and uh, putting things and having different widgets to interact with the users. So the main reason for for having this document is then that we can define uh, what kind of forms we have. We have the the ones that seek up information then that you then use to navigate into some kind of a document where you can probably see the see more details than you could in the search. And uh, then we also have the reports that differs very much from uh, from the documents. Well, the reports are more like paper form, not necessarily paper, but they are uh, like, um, well, of course, read only and uh, um, dumps even more information in, in text format or images, of course. Um, and also once we had the, the seeker strategy and the document strategy, we quite quickly notice the need when when we have one of these uh, pickers or combo boxes and uh, the items in the combo box or picker goes above like 30 40 maybe over 100 or when it's 200 it's totally worthless to have them in a, a combo box and, and you want something else so uh, then we uh, sort of made the seeker thing reusable so you could bring that up as as a modal form and use the seeker to pick a few things one or many depending on the use case and then have those uh, associated back to the information in the document form so this has been very successful in in solving uh, um, both the small easy cases when setting single links and multi-links and also the the complex cases when setting 
single links and multi links. Um, as we had that, we were quite happy. Uh, everything was done, but the navigation was also uh, quite a, a big part that we need to have users to jump around betwe between the document forms and, and opening the seeker forms, etc. So, so that was something that came uh, pretty early on. And uh, what we have reached now is uh, sort of, uh, yeah, as you, let's just look at uh, the example to um, start those servers and Whoa, 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 whoa. Click that link, I guess. So we get the, we put actions over here. Nothing stopping you from putting an action as a button on the view. But uh, these have been very helpful in large systems because we can make them on uh, the, the class. Uh, setting actions by classification. So you don't need to remember all the places where you want to run the show thing. And that could be calculated by the system based on, on the types. Of course, for really large systems, that kind of broke down. What we have noticed is that it sort of breaks because it's very seldom that you introduce a class action and you want it to be available in all the views where you can see this type of information. So uh, what uh, uh, at least I think is that there's a segmentation of the application into some kind of um, yeah, groups uh, or uh, some, some kind of user segments of the application that uh, and, and you would want to, to filter the class actions based on that, possibly. Um, well, you've got, you've got two things to factor in, security um, and use case. Yeah. The way you present a certain piece of data is going to be more optimized in a different presentation for a different usage. Um, but you still need your um, operations for your classes to be available globally um, <clears throat> that you would then change in your view model based on either security access or role. Yeah. So um, as we did with the security access, that has been very successful, I think, with the, well. with the um, access groups so that you can uh, hide actions from view completely or just disable actions depending on um, data you have in the system and since you have that uh, those expressions to enable visibility or uh, enable on actions um, and you have access to the logged in user then you can do I think all the the fine tune granule um, access rights that uh, you always need to do because yeah, we have seen uh, environments where you try to solve all that those things in Active Directory by doing groups. And then, of course, it sort of explodes uh, with uh, thousands of groups because these users, if they are in this situation for this organization and uh, the information is in this state, then they should have access. And uh, I've seen uh, companies that literally end up with the thousands of access groups depending on these uh, sort of explosions of uh, combinatory that they need to do. And, and you can work around that if, when putting the uh, access control rights inside the system and, and def that's what all systems do eventually. 
of course, then it's important that you can't hack into behind the system. And that's why web technology is uh, so accepted because then everything is evalu evaluated on the server and not in the code on the client. Of course, everything of that is uh, potentially flipping back now with the Blazor and doing fat clients. So that's another story about uh, and turning, getting the um, access control system back into the on the client code and make it hackable. Yeah, so it, it's good that you say that we have multiple cases to sort of factor in because I think at least these actions that we have done for multiple reasons, like this one adds a detail uh, and that detail isn't even on screen, so that was a bad example. If I go into this, it's sort of add, add rows to this grid. But um, other actions navigate, and, and we really didn't do any separation between navigating actions and actions that change information. And maybe that was a mistake, or maybe that is some, uh, uh, some kind of insight that has grown on us because many users of uh, our uh, tooling want to have a view like more like this they don't want to see they they think this is uh, sort of scary uh, and and doesn't fit with the web paradigm um, and also as you did now Lars with autosave uh -huh. Uh, many of the web pages out there aren't having these. Why do I need to save? I've changed it already. So if I, I change this to six, I'm done. I don't need to press save, some users think. So it depends on what kind of system you build, of course. But, but I'm thinking along the lines that we should sort of um, maybe introduce some um, designable um, differentiation of actions or we should have the framework analyze actions and to start with maybe just have two distinct areas where the navigating actions are and where the um, information changing actions are of course an information changing action might also navigate because it's a quite a common case that you create an object and open a new form to fill in the details of that object so it's not clear cut navigate but it's sort of um, one area where you have the toolbox where you can do stuff and another area where you have the um, navigation where you can jump around. One thing that I, I've found more and more, and I've been contemplating, if if one of the things that we are lacking or don't don't think about that much is that, I mean, when people press a button, they usually, um, ex like most things you do, you ex not to be able to save the result of a button. Is that true? I mean, if you have a new, maybe you have a list that grows, but even that, yeah, may, maybe. But in a lot of cases, uh, we are not good maybe at combining like except at the bottom or next. And that next should both like move a state machine and say where you are. So like you go forward. Uh, I, I see that many are very confused about that, that you press a button and then you have to like save the effect of a button. Mm. Yeah. So if uh, this add detail was a, a button, um, yeah. I'm just saying, I, I don't know, I'm sure there are exceptions and I, I was just, but it just feels like we have one thing that goes on with mobiles are mostly for seeing data and 
an app like Twitter, I think another interesting difference is between the checkbox and the switch. Both are booleans, right? Mm. Checkbox and a switch. But they kind of a switch is you turn something or it's it's like a setting, but a switch is like you expect if you if you <laughs> if you turn on the switch in your living room, you wouldn't have to turn on the switch and then press save next to the switch. <laughs> no. So it's uh, so it's like implied mm. that it also happens. So if we were to have a um, uh, Boolean variable here. Um, um, I'm wondering, I think we're maybe lacking some of the implied meanings to some things and that the, I don't know if it's Apple or whoever, you know, got this new way of working, um, but that's what I would say we're, we might be missing. And so maybe our actions need to be more configurable or that they should both have like a data part, a navigation part, and a save state part. Yeah, how do you get the switch? I don't remember. Uh, you there's a called switch switch. The switch. Uh, yeah. Down, down. Over there. It sort of lends itself to that problem we've talked about before of um, filtering versus querying, right? Filtering you expect immediate feedback. Whereas querying, you set criteria and then execute the query. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Unless you have a single criteria only, such as in pretext search. So a text search, generally, I would call a filter. And as the user types, you would, like what I do is I have a timer mm -hmm. and it waits 10 seconds and if the, if the um, query string doesn't change, then we filter. Yeah, uh, but that's... Well, <clears throat> technically that's a filtering, yes. From a user perspective, it would probably be a, still be a search, but it depends on context. I mean, when I type things in Google, I don't expect search hits to start popping up dynamically. There I expect to press a button when I'm done entering my search terms. But when I'm typing in other boxes, I expect an immediate response. It's very context dependent, it seems. Yeah, and, and it's really interesting that it is context dependent and, and that we don't have a clear definition on what the con uh, when to do what. And I haven't seen any um, good stabs at trying to explain when to do what. Uh, of course, all these books and videos on user experience surely should have um, considered these things. But but I uh, help me to find things if if uh, you know where they are because. I can't get any useful hints from most of the um, books that I, I have studied. Um, it, it feels like um, set theory and Boolean logic. And I would say a uh, search is changing your universe of discourse, whereas a filter is simply finding things inside that universe. Mm -hmm. um, and from uh, a programming perspective, um, it's very client server, right? You're retrieving 400 records. That's your universe of discourse. And then as you type, you're filtering um, within that universe. Mm -hmm. You kind of need to be explicit about both of those in terms of your UI so your user knows mm -hmm. what they're looking for and when they would have to switch from one to the other in terms of finding something. Oh, uh, yeah. That's that's interesting. Filtering is, is within the the known space of the user's head, you could say, and search is when you look outwards, which is actually what the words mean. So, but it's good that you kind of stated that. And, and I'm getting back to this with 
with intent. I mean, if we, the, the action, uh, because we have like, a lot of times I, I find myself, I have to do like a done button and then I have to save that I press done or, and that is, I don't know how, can you, can you come up with a good way to express that generically also? You know, this thing that why do we sometimes feel that it should be saved? You have set it to do something. Yeah. And in other ch cases, you have just like, you're just temporarily, you know, you're, you're expressing in more information, but you, s you kind of expect it to not do it right away. So it's sort of a state machine where one of the states is that you're mm -hmm. done, uh, imply that you're finished. Um, the other component to this, so I use a visual control to show basically what my universe of discourse is so my user can see that. Mm -hmm. And then I show what, if, if the text box that they're editing in isn't good enough, I'll show that as well. But I have that explicitly on the screen. But the other component to your universe of discourse which is going to matter a lot in M-Driven, is when was it last refreshed? Mm. And so I always I timestamp it as well, because if, if you're waiting for a new record to enter and you're searching for it, if your universe of discourse is old, then you'll never find it. Mm. And in client-server, that's critical. Yeah. So um, when we have these kind of... Uh... I know we have used this pattern uh, a lot uh, when when there are complex rules to what we expect from the user. We sort of um, create a um, a derived attribute uh, stating what's missing. So it would go something like uh, if I would just do it say as a view model column I could go like uh, if uh, some uh, self dot sum int is null then I return must fill sum int else just empty string and uh, if we and if if we put lots of these uh, as a as one derived attribute on thing we we get the effect to some good feedback to the user that uh, what we expect the user to do um, and let's make that uh, static <coughs> uh, upload uh, while you're doing this I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to bow out from my yeah. perspective being um, very my audience being very uh, technical they are always changing things in in the discourse if you will um, such try constantly trying what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. I mean, it's a very analytical exchange between the user and, and the programmers. Mm. And so it's very important to have a very distinct point at which you want to, okay, I'm done, I'm persisting. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to throw that out there. But I have, unfortunately, I have a prearranged meeting I have to go to. So yes. I'll catch up with the rest of this conversation on my, when I watch it back online. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank All you right. very much. See you in the autumn again. Because, yep. yeah, good. See you then. Yeah, have a nice summer. So, um, if, if you do things like this, you, you can get the immediate feedback on what's left to do. And, and uh, we have had some success with putting um, quite large fields like this on the screens. Um, what's needed be, uh, before you can move on and consider this done. And uh, as the user works they, their way through the form, it will update. So once they fill this one in, it uh, 
and I've set some red style on it as well to, to signal that uh, it was bad, now it's better. It's just like the constraints that we put down over mm. here, but but uh, more in your face and, and more uh, collected for a specific case. I do that with VIN numbers for vehicles that I think they have to be 17 characters long. Mm. And so I have a red label saying VIN number too short that turns black when it's correct and then goes back to red if it's too long. Mm. But it's an instant feedback. It's useful. Yeah. So um, there are many ways to do this on specific fields, but this was more like a, a way to uh, collect the whole set of, uh, like, instead of formulating it as an issue, it's more, this is what you should do next. So if you can formulate yourself as this is what you should do next, it's more or less like a story for the user to follow. But but um, uh, I think what Derek said that uh, if you have a complex system and uh, that invites to what if scenarios, mm. uh, what happens if I change this one? Uh, what if I delete this number here? Well, then I can't fix it because this must be filled. Uh, and you want to do try your way around then it's really helpful with a, a save or console context. And most of the cases that we see online that's described as good usability things are really aimed for a single user. When I write an email, I write, mm. it's only me. Um, but now, we get more and more like uh, really complex cases where we edit a Word document together. Then no one really saves. It's uh, pieces of information comes um, from everywhere. Might be undoable. That's that's a, that's a way to handle it. Mm. I was just picking up again on if you said Hans, how would we kill off the left menu field well, if we wanted to? Can yeah. we? Mm -hmm. I mean just. You speculate mm. if if we had to kill it, what would yeah, we do? Yeah, if that? if we were to kill it, maybe we should um, have uh, two distinct areas. One area that is the mm. toolbox, and the toolbox is very context oriented. So it, uh, when it uh, relates to grids, it should probably be some free buttons on on the grid here uh, to show up the the normal. Um. Dennis, Dennis has, has, have you seen that, Hans? He has made a new context menu that is almost ready to use, I think, that is really much nicer, mm. uh, much, much more compact. And, and we talked about that. You can right click on a, on a row and get that. And we also talked about on a mobile, maybe that one should be three little dots at the end of the row when you are there or at the top. Yeah. So maybe we we need to find ways to move it into the uh, into the UI, but hopefully automatic if you don't put the effort into. Because as as M driven people, we don't want to spend any time doing anything if we can avoid it. No, exactly. Um, yeah. So was that the right way to put it, Dennis? But it is done. I didn't check it in, so it's oh, now okay. just under development. You <clears throat> will not receive it right now. But you can screen share. Or... So, one of the major issues that we see when when switching from VPF to web is that we have these kind of models where delete detail is the single action, and and uh, since we made the decision that <clears throat> any action that's the first action in the queue should execute if you double click on a row we get the the effect that um, mm -hmm. yeah we delete stuff when we don't think we should so if i um, and of course that's just a a um, bug a think bug in the model but uh, still it's uh, a pointer to something that isn't quite right so um, we should really, 
if we were to separate the toolbox thing from navigating things. This should be a toolbox thing and that should be very clear that um, mm -hmm. it's a toolbox thing. Um, and these are navigating things. So maybe all the navigating things that are dependent on context maybe should end up in a uh, menu or a uh, box like this that are separate from from the toolbox or maybe it's uh, the left side but uh, there are two areas on it these are navigating and these are toolbox I'm not sure I usually mm -hmm. try to, to do that myself but but you're right I, I have a, a category called manage that I put toolbox stuff in and mm -hmm. then I have another one called show or you know do and I put all the navigating things in there yeah so so that's one way to address it but uh, yeah, yeah right. it, it doesn't really um, I know it's a manual separation more than, and not very designer or user friendly no at least the, the user uh, can't really trust it it's up to the designer. So if it's a, a consistent designer, then it will be like this. But if you're inconsistent um, or so, so it would be. But we need to, to scan the web for examples for, for how different systems do these things. Because there's also the, the option to put but buttons on the screen and what separates a button from an action? Why do we sometimes put buttons and why, why do we sometimes have actions for, for the same things? And it, sometimes it's both. Yeah. And we haven't really put down the foot on that one either. You can see in a lot of UIs now that you also save space by basically, and we, we do that already. I mean, we do hide a button in something else like a image or a text or mm. click on something and then that is an action that you do something with so that's also of course a way yeah to, that's to, what we call rendered by mm. um but i think one of the and, and that is as some of the work he did now also relates to this single double and right clicking on rows uh, that needs needs some attention, but the, the bigger question, of, as as you point to it, Hans, is that we might need to improve the classification of what a, an action is and does, and mm. how the user should perceive it. Yeah, and uh, maybe we should have modes to start up the turnkey system in not showing the. Uh, the left menu but instead having something like these buttons floating around uh, somewhere that that brings up the information so um, and maybe then the save and cancel can't live here or in this button but need to show up more like they do when um, when the screen gets tight what well, I, I wonder if you need like One of the things I find happens when I'm changing my UI is I'll come up with a new format for something. Like buttons, I really agree. If they're visual, they can be smaller. Like, for example, in a lot of my screens now, to add a record or to delete a record, I use a button with a plus sign for add and a, and a minus sign for delete. So it makes a nice small button, right? The challenge is that you've then got to um, populate that throughout your entire UI. And it'd be really cool if you go, okay, you know, if somewhere I had a generic um, concept of an add button and I change, like even the height or the color or whether or not it um, can respond to the tab key, mm. you know, that kind of stuff evolves with time. It's actually something I was thinking about this morning. Um, and if you can, in one place, say, okay, all of my add buttons are now plus sign um, and they're this big. Right? They're this tall or they're this color or whatever it is. Then you can end up with a consistent UI with by just changing one thing. 
Yeah. But what happens is over time your UI evolves and of course your high traffic areas are typically the ones that look the best and work the best. And it's not the end of the world if you're you know, more your administrative screens for editing stuff that you never touch aren't as pretty or as consistent, but it's still dumb, right? It's, mm. it, it would be better that it would you just change the ad button's going to look like this now, and they're all like but that. Then be you're, huge. you're in the dilemma of are all ad buttons ad buttons? Uh, because if you design a style, that's one way to do it, uh, and you make a style reference on add buttons to make them look a certain way um, but then the action they do different things of course because they are in different contexts so they add different things to to different stuff uh, and that's fine uh, but you always get into um, this metaphysic is this ad really the same kind of ad as that ad over the, there and uh, so you start to do possibly multiple styles. Um, so it's always hard to, to get uh, one to rule them all, but uh, that doesn't uh, um, sort of, uh, you, you should still try, I, I guess, to, to uh, be really consistent, but it can still Yeah, be even hard. if it's 80, 20, right? Even yeah. if 80% of them follow the rule, that's usually good enough. Yeah. I agree. So, <clears throat> as long as we have uh, used the styles consistently, then we can just attack the styles and, and that will um, change the whole, whole of the application. But of course, it, it will require that you consistently style things. So, mm -hmm. you know how to find them. But, but yeah, I was thinking again about uh, getting rid of the left thing house and mm -hmm. maybe I should make, try to make some mock-ups. Because one thing that we do today, we actually put the actions of the root object in the view together with the actions of each table yeah or so this and, list and is that is the first thing to drop mm. i mean conceptually that things should reside in a in a list the actions should reside inside the list mm. exactly so, so these things um no at least this one that is yeah. uh, connected to each row mm. probably should I'm not sure if it should be on the row because that would be repetitive somehow, but uh, it should at least be on the, the grid some or the table somehow. We already talked about when we talked with Alex and Dennis about on the small screens, they should be top right three dots. And on, on big screens, when it w let's know when you have a mouse, when you go over the row, they can, they can pop up three dots to the right. Mm -hmm and but you can't see that you hover with a finger so then you have to put it in the top yeah so and when the the saving console if if uh, we are working away from uh, needing to show the left side that might be a better approach initially that you shouldn't need to have it whenever these show up now you don't know that they are there but they could uh, use this strategy if they are visible or if yeah, exactly. so if they need to be shown they should float somewhere yeah uh, at least so we don't you don't get lost without any buttons yes because um of course now you know now you don't now you know mm. so that's uh, i think uh, um a fixable issue to, to make uh, this not an option. It should look like that then. Yeah. These like burger menus or what what they are called, mm. are they are they still like a, a hot thing or a bad thing or how do people view them? 
they, they I think they call them burger menus, but they look different. They, um, it's sort of. I'm just saying that I think they're fiddly to get to. Mm. It, they actually mostly like this menu, always used as a navigational like thing, and uh, it's this hamburgers. <laughs> they always like. Uh, it actually popular on mobile devices more than I would say on the desktop mm -hmm. because it's it's quite like easy to you know have this snuff bar at the top rather than like a sidebar uh, uh, in you know uh, as navigational thing but um, this like hamburgers they just always like appear better and you no. Know, uh, useful in on mobile devices. Hmm. Yeah, so um, it's quite common that you don't have the menus up here, the main menu, but instead you have all the navigations in the left side uh -huh. because there isn't much to do in the application, so it's no problem. We can have everything here, and then you jump around between different screens uh, using the left side. But the problems always arise when you have a lot of things to do in the application. Oh. That, and I guess it goes back to the Apple thing. Uh, the main secret to the Apple design pattern is remove everything. Like Google, it's just one button and a search box. It's perfect. You can't misunderstand it. Um, and uh, as soon as you need to add lots of stuff, uh, you're bound to confuse someone. Maybe. Well, one thing I find confusing in some applications is when there is both a hamburger menu with three lines on it and an overflow menu with three dots on it. Mm. I mean, those are both menus, but they are subtly different. The overflow menu usually contains things that dynamically doesn't fit in the main UI and what's there and what's not might depend on my window size and such things. While the hamburger menu is more a structured thing, I'm looking at the uh, chat client right now it has the three dots things and it's for more options so I suppose that's the correct choice here because there are some quick actions to turn off the microphone and the camera and hang up and then this three dots things for the rest but kind of, yeah. kind of fiddly to find a proper balance there yeah so some design seems to use this three buttons as in synonymous with the hamburger menu and mm. then it can start getting really confusing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's easy to use uh, these menus to, to just put stuff in there that you're not sure where to put anywhere. So, yeah. so at least you can reach it here. But how... That's the real problem. And if you, if you think about what Apple did back when you know, they introduced the Macintosh and their, their UI, it was about understanding the user need better. So mm. if you've got UI that's, where does this button go? Why do I have this button? Why have I got two menus? It's a design issue, yeah. um, not, nothing more. I don't really think it matters what type of menu icon you have. If it's smart and it's, it's what's appropriate for that user at that time, you know, I don't think anybody's going to complain too much if it's a triple dot versus a hamburger stack, as long as it contains what I need, when I need it, and preferably all I need, and that's it. Yes, as I agree. The hamburger yeah. is very much, a, um, to quote Hans, that is fashion. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but it sort of is a concept to, to hide important information mm -hmm. um, that is revealed uh, if you do an action, um, and that's the option, of course, that that we have, should it be hidden or not? And uh, depending on 
your users. Well, we could have this so that it would always float back uh, and you can just pick one and then it goes back automatically to gain area here. But that quite a lot of users need to um, scan this to find out what's possible to do and what where's where can I jump, etc. So um, we have a project, and then I heard in that project that they 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 don't want to save cancel up there, and so they want to put it somewhere else. But it seems to be that they don't have any real idea of where that would be. No. And as and I would argue that not having save cancel if you need them in the same place at all times is a disaster. I mean, just look at Azure if you have used it, Microsoft's UI. The same button and apply or whatever they call it, it's like three different words and they're all over the place and sometimes you need to use them and sometimes you don't. And you never know until you have tried leaving the page if you were supposed to save or not. Yeah. I agree that uh, that's hard because it's sometimes off screen even, so you have to scroll to find it. Oh, there's a save button. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I would be st strong advocate, I think, for at least that we have a default standard yeah. place that we but that we put them, even if that is like a floating thing to the bottom left or bottom right or whatever. The reason we put them top left, if I remember correctly, is that it's always there. It's very rare in, in a Western language that you don't see the top left part of the screen. Um, so that's why they're there. Mm -hmm. But on the mobile phone, you, you don't want to cover the whole screen with your thumb to press save. So that's why they're in the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, of course, because that's stretching it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Depending on how long how large your phone is. Um, hmm. So we... But do you have any wishes that the two customers we have online today? It's mostly we talking ourselves. Yeah. Maybe it's time for the summer break. Yeah, I think it is. So we're going to pick it up uh, in August, I think. Um, so stay tuned for that. But. But what, what we can deduce is that um, there is no one screaming that um, don't change anything. And uh, as uh, we all know, change is um, everywhere and always an option. So we should... Well, what it's worth, my comment would be make it overt to the programmer how to have a standard style for a save, a cancel, yeah. or whatever, and ensure that it's used consistently through their product. And if that's, you know, in your face, um, <clears throat> I think that's half the battle. Mm. Because the last thing you need are weird, you know, like, oh, this this save is a is a link, but this one's a button, and this mm -hmm. one's a navigate off the screen, or, you know, that's a that's bad, um, but if it's if it's overt and um, you know a single style that can be changed and it's it's you know you kind of as a programmer have no choice but to do it. I think that would go a long way to um, making UI that's usable. And where it is is not that big of a deal, I don't think. Mm. Yeah. So uh, has any one of you worked with the? usability experts in any depth talk to them i have a feeling that they um, have a hard time to separate uh, the fashion from from uh, the true functionality and uh, it's uh, usability is uh, both these things it's of course it should look okay but uh, the functionality is really, really important because otherwise the user wouldn't be there. Of course, the usability expert is only there to talk about the usability. He's not there to actually use the system or do anything, so he might get stuck on the looks of it. 
but that's not really doing the job, I think. So a big feature that we implemented in version two of our software was color and coloring rows based on how well they did or didn't meet certain criteria. Mm. Like if something is overdue, it's red. If it's on schedule, it's green. And if it's in the middle, it's yellow. That red, yellow, green paradigm we use you know, all over the place in our system now. And it's, it might sound dumb, it might sound like fashion, but it's not, it's, yeah. it's functionality because it's easy to see. That visual feedback is really powerful. Yes. So that, that coloring was um, a big deal. Mm -hmm. I agree, that's uh, um, really important to use uh, uh, style, styling to convey information. And, and that's not really only fashion, that's just that that you need to um, use other ways than text to communicate, and that's that's good. I would say. Yeah, another piece that we did. Oh, I'm sorry. With uh, no. regularity was we for date and time values. Instead of displaying a date and time, which is useless, we would display it as an age. This is ten minutes ago. This is two no. months ago. Yeah. Or this due in two weeks or whatever. And that was a big paradigm shift too because the date time value is useless. But that requires a different level of thinking because it's very much a take your universe of discourse and snapshot it in time, right? This was two weeks ago as of right now. But if you look at it next month, this is six weeks ago. Mm. And that matters. Yeah. So I actually have that in some systems um, like a generic function that you send in every daytime too uh, and uh, if it's today it's uh, time of day and if it's uh, yesterday or, or further back it's the date so but uh, your uh, approach is even more elaborate to to say the the age of of the item should think about that. I, I actually did something similar also that might be an interesting thing for if you're using M driven. I, I had a I have an object of I'm in a class that's called a calendar. So and that one has now a a, a date time a static uh, you know no get I, I made it it couldn't make a static attribute anyway so it has get time you get a date time but that value is unsubscribable. So, but it, you have to tell, so I, I made a couple of them. One is like daytime subscribe per minute. One is subscribe per 10 minutes because there were different use cases, but that's usually what you want because I, I came back one day to the screen, it's like, but it still says that it's today? No, it's not today, it was yesterday. Why haven't it updated? And I realized, ah, yeah, 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 it was a snapshot. So, so, um, and I was thinking to mention that to you sometimes, Hans, also that maybe we could have some subscribable date times that has it, that you actually tell it how often you need the time to be mm. dirty. You could yeah, mm. to invalidate yeah. it. And and, and it's recalculated, if it's on screen, of course. Mm. You could have a timestamp for the timestamp. Mm, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that is, uh, yeah, you know, you, with, it wasn't a problem back in 19, I mean, in the 80s, we, we didn't even have clocks. You had to tell the computer what the time was every time you booted, <laughs> because it was, it was too expensive to have a clock in it. Yeah, we're, the battery and, and, would now, and now those computers are 24-7, 365, and then they need to update the screen, screen even if you're not looking at it. Yeah. It's, it's useful to the user, though, for them to see the age of something. Yeah, I exactly. agree. Good. So I don't think we get any further no. on the allotted time, but um, thank you very much for... Um, helping us to discuss these issues and I'm pretty sure that we will continue to do some um, design approaches to, to how to address this. Uh, we have a few customers that uh, drive the 
the need for this. So we will work with them. If you have a, you know, like, yeah, I really like this UI. It's well thought through and blah, 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 in my phone or my computer in a web browser or, yeah. Yeah, send I mean, us a link. Send us a link or a, a screenshot. screenshot. Yeah. It, with examples, um, it's very helpful. Mm. Good. Um, with that said, we will be back in August and, and send out an, a note uh, in the calendar to, I'm not sure what date yet, but uh, we will run Wednesdays as uh, per usual. And uh, I hope you have a great summer. Yeah. Do them. We will have a great summer, you too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah, Appreciate it. Bye. See you in August, then. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.